the Yerkes Observatory, the Yerkes family, I don't know what they made their money in, but they were very generous with it. And they had founded the um, largest 40 inch at that point mm -hmm. telescope refracting. It was before the reflecting. And, the refract and they had put that telescope, they said, as f uh, no more than 100 miles from the city of Chicago. That was a stipulation. So it's 99.9 .9 miles, I believe, in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, as far away as they could get. And that uh, was f the University of Chicago's astronomy department. And you have to see a time when planetary astronomy is not taught anywhere. I mean, it, there were four planetary astronomers in the, in the day and age, and I know them all now, you know. Um, and anyway, so we ended up there. He was a physics student because he had to be a physics student in order to get into the astronomy. But his interest was always astronomy. Physics was secondary. So um, your major contribution to science, perhaps, and though you have many contributions, you, you're a noted uh, experimentalist, you're a noted theoretician, but it's perhaps the theory of symbiogenesis, the idea that uh, evolution didn't arise slowly through a sequential series of mutations, but that arose by adventitious, perhaps, intimacy of strangers, that is, uh, organisms coming together in mutually beneficial ways, not intentionally, of course, but in ways that would then provide positive selection material. Yeah. Um, this Can I rephrase that a little bit? Please. Not because you haven't done a nice job, but you fall into a f trap that it took me 30 years to get out of, no. and that is to use words like mutually beneficial or cost-benefit analysis and so on. I, I object violently to that terminology because yeah, I can see we, that. We, we, what we don't want to do is name organisms by the outcome of their relationships, which is, of course, what that is. Yeah. But, and, and rather than say, um, rather that organisms, new organisms, novelty evolves mostly, not mostly by uh, random mutation, I would say, or you said not by random mutation, I think that's what you said. Yes. I would say that random mutation, of course, does play a large role in, in evolution. But the concept is that random mu mutation is never enough to go mm -hmm. from one species to another. Right. Uh, random with respect to selection. So well, random mutation, changes in DNA, of course, can be documented. They exist all the time. But what we're saying here, and we have lots of documentation, which I'd love to tell you about, is that when you get something really novel, that is a new species, a new organ, new tissues, new organelles, new features in evolution, it's never by random mutation. If you take a Drosophila and you mutagenize it with a chemical mutagen, an x-rays or something like that, that's, you get a sick Drosophila, you don't get a new species of Drosophila. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what's been shown very recently is that if, you, if, you, uh, if some of these insects actually acquire mycoplasmas or other Wolbachia-type bacteria, they can, in one fell swoop, um, now metabolize new nitrogen compounds. They, uh, in, in just the acquisition and integration of bacteria will change that insect uh, dramatically. So, so there are discontinuities, like you said. And of say. course, bacteria is so diverse, so there are so many opportunities. Yeah. My, yes, my favorite example, which is so graphic, um, and maybe Paul Falkowski on this campus is going to invite me back to show, these, show this to you, is what we call green animals. And these are animals. They're slugs, uh, snails without shells. They're worms. They're completely recognizable. One of them in the film that I'm telling you about, one of them is, belongs to our chordate phylum, and it looks like a little tadpole. In all of these cases, the hydra is another one, the coral is another one. In all of these cases, under starvation conditions in the light, you know, they're, they're in the light, they're marine mostly, and they're starving, they eat algae, and usually they digest the algae. But the algae will put up, uh, or cyanobacteria, will put up a fight. And when they put up a fight, they resist digestion, and they continue to leak. And the net upshot is that the animal, the f animal's food becomes the animal's body. And in these cases that I w will show, the animals have become completely green. And they r inherit the greenness to all of the offspring. So in any given population of these animals, for example, Convoluta roscafensis, which is on the coast of Brittany and the Channel Islands and now Spain and England, these worms look like seaweed and they fix 
carbon into photosynthate like seaweed, mm. but you get close, they have muscles, they have mouths, they're completely green, and they're photosynthetic. Now, they didn't go from a translucent worm to a completely photosynthetic worm that lies on the beaches and photosynthesizes as if it were a plant. They didn't do that step by random mutation. They did it by acquisition of a microbial genome and the integration of the genome. That's what we're saying. Uh, and it's saying. always been very difficult for people who study evolution to understand how you can acquire something as dramatic as a flagellum or a cilia or photosynthesis. And I think Where there are many genes, there's right. thousands of genes involved. And, and yes. this gives us a view of evolution that suggests that, if I may use a word here, that evolution is punctate. It is that punctuate. It, it occurs gradually, and then there are great leaps exactly. when the symbiogenesis exactly. occurs, and then it's gradual, and then right. another leap. But I don't want to get more credit than I'm due at that either. There are, there were um, several, there's a wonderful book by a woman called Khachina, and she's the second generation of people who've studied this, Laya Nikolaevna Khachina, and it's called um, uh, Concepts of Symbiogenesis, a Historical Critical Study of the Russian Botanists. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. in the 19th century, Mayershkovsky is the most notable one, Konstantin Sergeyevich Mayershkovsky, wrote many papers, like La Plante commun uh, Communité Scientifique, the plant as a scientific community, where he argued that plants, all of them, were the products of symbiogenesis, and they had gotten uh, photosynthetic, photosynthesis secondarily. And this stuff was floating around, but it was repressed for at least a generation. And I had teachers who at least had us read, not, not in Russian, but in the English translation, some of these people's work. So I was aware of this, of this work, and they deserve a lot of credit. But the experimental methods weren't there to test it. You're so well known as an educator. Um, you've published numerous books. Um, I think this is one of your more recent books, Acquiring yeah, Genomes. The, um, the, the books have a, a scholarly tack but there's also a clear emphasis on trying to educate the general public. And I noticed that now that... Uh, this is old, actually. I bought them all back because they were remainder. Well, they're still good. Yeah, of course. They're wonderful. <laughs> Evolution <laughs> doesn't get old quickly. Yeah, right. And uh, you have a, a, actually a coloring book done with uh, your son, Dorian. Right. And um, this is part of your uh, effort to reach out to the general public, improve science education, and also, of course, make people aware of your ideas. Um, do you think, uh, as a woman, um, do you feel that being a woman uh, presented an extraordinarily great challenge for you as a scientist? Do you think it still presents a challenge for women today who want to go into I science? I can't answer the question for women today because I can't talk about other people's experience with any kind of authenticity. So I would rather avoid that question because I have no answer to it. But I want to say very clearly that I never had a problem as a woman, part, partly probably because although my father later had some sons, in the, my father and mother had four children and all of them, they actually had five, and all of them were daughters, and I was the eldest. So there was no interfamilial double standard because there were no, there were no young boys. And I always loved being around men and I never had problems being in science classes with mostly men. So I, I, did, I had lots of problems, but the problems were intellectual. That is, people didn't like what I was saying, they didn't like me reading the old stuff. Why? Because you know how science is, if it's at least at MIT library, if any article is older than eight years, it's transferred from science to humanities. Science is considered now, and if it's not now or tomorrow or yesterday, it's not science. And that, all, that was never my attitude. I felt that in order to, and that was probably the Chicago background, in order to really understand a problem like the, like the material basis of heredity, you had to know what people had done in the past, mm -hmm. and you had to know things that were out, out of your field. And so that's where I really had problems. My instructors, for the most part, wanted me to stick to what I was supposed to do, do the homework, do the da-da, and not deviate to other fields. And this became acute when I realized that these phenomena of symbiogenesis in cell origins must have happened at a time and a place on the Earth. And they must have happened before we had trilobites, which are perfectly good arthropod animals. And that's, of course, the beginning of the classical fossil record.